Hello. In this video we discuss themes of persecution, including cases of violence against Jewish people and other minorities. We've tried to handle it as sensitively as we can, but there are some intense themes which some viewers might find quite upsetting. If this is the case, I might suggest that you skip this video. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome. My name's Philip, and today we're going to be continuing our series on the chain of being. In previous episodes, we've discussed the conceptual origins of the chain of being, as well as how it fits in with the feudal system. In this particular episode, we're going to explore how it responded to the people who didn't fit quite as neatly into that system. Now, this applies to several different groups, but perhaps the most significant will be the Jewish population of medieval Europe. The relationship between the Jewish people and the Christian nations of Western Europe is without a doubt a complicated one. It's also one that starts a little later than you may expect. By the year 1000, there were almost no Jewish communities in Western Europe. The majority of the global Jewish population lived in the Islamic states of the Middle East, Asia Minor and North Africa. Those that were in Europe were in the Islamic controlled Iberian Peninsula and Italian Peninsula and those that weren't were in areas that had only recently been conquered by Christians in those same peninsulas. The low Middle Ages in Western Europe were not especially concerned with Judaism. That all began to change, however, following the millennium. The Western states began to stabilize and prosper. The Latin church grew in strength, and these new Christian kingdoms were able to become less insular. It's within the 11th century that we see an economic boom in Western Europe, and many of these nations began inviting Jewish communities, enticing them with generous offers to uproot and risk travelling to a new nation, all in the hope that they would bring some of their knowledge and prosperity with them. And it worked! It's in this period that we see Jewish communities become established in Flanders, France, Germany and England. William the Conqueror, not long after being crowned King of England, sent out one such invitation and founded the first Jewish community in London. But as Western Europe continued to prosper and these communities grew, new concerns began to arise. As we've previously discussed, the chain of being and feudalism go hand in hand. This is because that drive towards the divinely ordained structure was also a push towards unity. Unity of people, of nations, of church and state. This is the period where the Christian kingdoms become Christendom, a single homogenous unified collection of Christian states all pushing with united effort towards that divinely ordained structure. You can probably see how this was going to cause problems. Before that though, I want to talk a bit about cultural narratives. Cultural narratives are a sort of story that people tell about themselves, and in doing so it helps them create a sense of identity and purpose. We'll discuss them more in a future episode, but for now, I just want to explain the Jewish and Christian cultural narratives that developed in medieval Europe. The Jewish narrative is one of three parts, each inspired by the writings of the Torah and Talmud. There is the glorious past, the age of the kings of Israel and the prophets, and of an immediate relationship with God. Then 
there comes the period of exile. This is the period following the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem and the loss of a Jewish kingdom. A great deal of Jewish prophetic writings talk about the suffering the Jewish people will endure before finally being redeemed and bringing about the much looked to future, the coming of the Messiah and the restoration of the Jewish people. This three-part cultural narrative was very significant in a lot of medieval Jewish writing, and its cultural repercussions are still around today. What's fascinating is how this same three-part narrative was reworked by Christians into a new cultural narrative that then loomed so large in the medieval period. Christianity, being based in Judaism, shares the same glorious past. They also acknowledge the period of exile. However, the Christian narrative is that this period of exile came about because of the Jewish people's rejection and ultimately crucifixion of Jesus Christ. In the Christian version of the narrative, the Jewish people lost their status as chosen people, and God turned his attention to the Gentiles instead. Forgotten are the invitations from European leaders to Jewish settlers. In northern France, there are 12th and 13th century town records which claim the Jewish members of the community's ancestors came and settled there immediately following their exile from Israel after the crucifixion, when in fact they had been invited only a few generations ago. Finally, the glorious future of the Christian narrative is not the vindication of the Jewish people, but rather the second coming of Christ and the conversion of all people to Christianity. Why is that important? Well, it helps to understand the special relationship between the Church and Jewish Europeans. The official Church stance on Judaism was surprisingly tolerant and in fact protective. Anti-Jewish violence was almost always condemned by the Church. The logic was that Jewish people were suffering a divine punishment and it was not the place of humans to interfere with that. Often, the language of Genesis was used, a book common to both religions. When Cain murders his brother Abel, God punishes him by forcing him to wander the earth forever, and marks him so that anyone he meets will know he is undergoing divine punishment and know not to harm or kill him, as that would interfere with said punishment. The image of the wandering Jew became somewhat folkloric, and the church readily drew comparisons between Cain and the Jewish population they had power over. Jewish people were forced to wear identifying clothes, usually hats or badges, not only to separate them further from society, but also to show that they were not to be harmed. Obviously, this didn't always work. When King Louis IX of France ordered the expulsion of Jewish moneylenders in the 1250s, he was opposed by his barons, who pointed out that it was a necessary profession and that the king himself had borrowed money before. On a more personal note, there are records of a trial of a Jewish moneylender named Bon David in Marseille in 1317. All of the Christian witnesses who are brought forward testify to Bon David's good character and his position as not just a neighbour, but a friend. One particular witness claimed that Bon David was more righteous than anyone he had ever met in his life. He does not believe that there is one more righteous than he in the whole world, for, if one may say so, he never met or saw a Christian more righteous than he. There are multiple records of Jewish communities, when under threat, turning to their Christian neighbours for help. In Mainz in 1096, Christians formed a human wall 
to protect their Jewish neighbours from an anti-Semitic mob. In the same year, in Worms and Cologne, when anti-Jewish violence broke out, the Jewish communities turned to their neighbours and even to the local bishops in order to hide them and protect them. In Würzburg in 1146, a washerwoman rescued a young Jewish girl who was being violently forced to convert by some cruel knights. Unfortunately, these moments of kindness are overshadowed by the much more distressing cases of violence against the Jewish people in medieval Europe. Anti-Jewish sentiment could often be traced back to the fact that even when it was being generous, the church saw no place for Jewish people in Christendom. They were outside of Christian society, they didn't fit into the chain of being, they were the other. The other is the name given in modern academia to that which is not what I am. Now that may seem very simple and obvious, but it's an idea that is universal to human cultures. The other plays a very significant role in our understanding of identity. When we define who we are, we are also by extension defining who we are not. Conversely, when we define the other, it strengthens our own sense of identity by contrast. I don't know what I am, but I know what I'm not. The other can be, and often is, employed politically, playing on our tribal tendencies, outsiders, foreigners, them as opposed to us. The other can also be used positively, uh, representing the exotic, the exciting unknown. Equally, the other can be scary, the unknowable enemy, the unfathomable alien. The other is the thing that doesn't fit, that doesn't belong, that causes problems by being different, and you can probably see why the other is so important to the chain of being. Remember that to the medieval mind, the chain of being represented a divine order to which society strove. And so, the other almost invariably represented a threat to that. And there were people in England and across Europe who had been placed outside of this social structure. Now, I'm not just talking about the Jewish population here, although they did make up the largest other in Europe at the time, but also travelling communities who we will discuss a little later. This othering could apply to anyone who wasn't part of the majority. People who had removed themselves from, or were never a part, of the land-based feudal system. Where did they fit in the chain? What class were they? To which estate did they belong? Where were they from? Could they be taxed? Were they even protected by the law at all? These questions and more no doubt assailed the medieval mind when confronted with the other. When social hierarchy carries a moral element, anything outside of that hierarchy is quickly deemed immoral, and violence often follows. Medieval history is tragically dripping in examples of suspicion and animosity towards those who didn't fit into the chain of being. Nowhere is this more evident than in the treatment of the Jewish community. Although, as we've mentioned, some communities were eager to jump to the defence of their Jewish neighbours, others proved quite the opposite. Christian ignorance of the Jewish religion led to accusations of ritualistic murder and witchcraft. When the body of a Christian youth named William turned up near Norwich in the 1140s, rumours began to circulate that he had been the victim of a Jewish ritualistic murder 
despite there being literally no evidence of such a thing. Although the case was dismissed out of hand by the court, a late arriving cleric named Thomas of Monmouth, keen to develop a cult of Saint William, began to circulate the idea that he had been martyred at the hands of this Jewish conspiracy. He even claimed to have spoken with an eyewitness of the event. Now the church denounced these claims straight away, but this was not an isolated case. Legal records show us that baseless claims against Jewish people were constantly being brought to court. The most pervasive rumour seeming to be that they drank human blood or else used it for nefarious rituals during Passover. These cases were almost always thrown out of court. But they were common enough that Emperor Frederick II convened a special council of Jewish converts to Christianity to investigate the matter. And when they came up with no evidence, he was able to dismiss the case and set a precedent so that such claims could never be brought before the imperial court again. When Pope Urban preached the militaristic pilgrimage that would become known as the First Crusade, he galvanised Christendom to make war against the Islamic Middle East. Although he didn't mention Jewish people at all, it wasn't long before the jingoistic sentiment that he had roused up was directed against them. Violence erupted against Jewish communities most dramatically in the Rhineland, where roving gangs of supposed pilgrims were reported as committing atrocious acts of cruelty and claiming that if they are supposed to face Christ's enemies abroad, first they would need to destroy his enemies in their homeland. It's notable that when Bernard of Clairvaux preached the Second Crusade, he included specific instructions not to harm any domestic Jewish communities. The 12th century brought with it a great many advancements, both social and political, but it also saw the advent of politically sanctioned persecution. The King of France, Philip Augustus, was the first monarch to order the expulsion of Jewish citizens from royal lands. Now, this was likely to actually set himself apart from his father, King Louis, who had been famously beneficial and helpful towards the Jewish citizens. He later rescinded the order, but the damage had been done. He had set a precedent. What's worse, those ejected from their homes would have to look for aid in neighbouring territories, thus furthering the negative image of wanderers, people without a place. The exact image which led to further acts of expulsion in the coming centuries, including from the King of England Edward I in 1290. Each of these forceful dislocations of populace was accompanied by violence. The idea of a people who didn't fit, who moved from place to place, who weren't tied to the feudal system, was anathema to the chain of being. And although we can never, ever excuse some of the atrocities committed in the Middle Ages, this does at least go some way towards explaining them. Although the Jewish people bore the brunt of this animosity, the same dislike of anyone outside of the chain fell on all who moved from place to place. Travelling musicians and mummers were widely enjoyed and regularly accused of immorality. If working the land and staying in your place was good, why would someone choose to travel except to commit untold acts of crime and debauchery? This line of thinking underpins the treatment of many travelling communities throughout the Middle Ages, and when the Romani people began to traverse Europe in the late Middle Ages, 
similar accusations were heaped upon them. Once again, biblical language was used, naming the people after the sinful Egyptians who had been scattered across the earth by God. It may come as no surprise that when periods of political instability came around, violence flourished. The chain of being promised good to the society that conformed, and so if something went awry, these rogue elements were to blame. The Black Death of the 14th century was immediately followed by bouts of violence all across Europe, with notable attacks against Jewish communities every few years. The chain of being gave people a sense of identity and purpose, but it did this by drawing clear lines in the sand. Barriers that have made their mark on history, the consequences of which we can still see today. Christendom knew what it was, and for better or worse, it knew what it was not. Thanks for watching. Farewell. Hey everyone, thank you for watching our video, the latest in our series about the chain of being. Our next one will be about medieval history and how they perceived their own history. This has been a really interesting topic that we've only been able to scratch the surface of. If you want to learn more about it, I would strongly recommend the Reassessing Jewish Life in Medieval Europe by Robert Shazan. It has proved an invaluable resource. We'll include a link in the description where you can purchase your own copy of this book. It is fantastic. Hopefully we'll see you again in our next video. Like and subscribe and all the good stuff. Farewell.